we're going to talk about the idea of a shipwrecked faith. Okay? Uh, the title for this message is called, How Seaworthy is Your Faith? And we're going to be looking in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20 is where we're going to start out. But we're going to go some other places as we get into it. Um, but, uh, of course, Timothy, uh, these are letters that Paul wrote to a young man in the ministry to give him advice on how to, to pastor and to, to lead a church. And, um, of course, Paul had had a lot of history with some of these churches in this area. Uh, specifically, we believe from history and other things that Timothy had some responsibility in the church there at Ephesus. And if you read the, the letter to the Ephesians, um, you know, they didn't always have the best of times in that church. Um, but uh, here is uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. If you'd stand as we read God's word. And it says, Timothy, my child, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that by them you may strongly engage in battle, having faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have suffered the shipwreck of their faith. Hymenaeus and Alexander are among them, and I have delivered them to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seen. So in this we see a couple of things. Uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, as we've already said, and he calls him his, his child, or his basically his son in the faith. Because um, he feels like he's mentored Timothy up in doing what Timothy's doing. And he's doing this letter to help him with pastoring there in Ephesus. Um, also, we find an interesting thing here. It says that uh, Timothy, um, in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you. So, uh, it had been kind of foretold about him that he was going to be a leader and do some things there within the church. Um, and, of course, as is common in a lot of these letters, uh, he was experiencing challenges and difficulties. Because he starts out that you may strongly engage in battle. And he even talks about some of the people that they're having trouble with. He says some have rejected uh, faith and a good conscience and have suffered the shipwreck of their faith. By rejecting having faith and by having a good conscience. Now, interestingly enough, it's the only time in Scripture this particular turn of phrase is used, right here in Paul, where he says, the shipwreck of your faith. So this is a one-time sort of thing. Uh, I know last Sunday when we were there at First Baptist with Brother Jeff, he was talking about the parable of the feeding of the 5,000. And that's one of the unique, uh, not parable, I'm sorry, the account of the feeding of the 5,000. And that's one of the few that appears in all four Gospels. You know, we have some stories that appear in one or two, or maybe three. But when it shows up in all four, that's usually a pretty serious thing. But here we have an instance where we only have this one mention of this phrase. And then he actually singles out two people, okay? <laughs> so, um, uh, I don't know how many of y'all are fans of uh, uh, Ray Stevens, but uh, I like some of his songs and have a lot of them memorized. Um, uh, anybody remember the Mississippi Squirrel Revival song? And he has a part in there, he says, uh, and then she started naming names. Well, here, Paul has done started naming names, okay? <laughs> so it's gotten serious. But he mentions these two people, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Hymenaeus is actually only mentioned in these letters to Timothy. He's mentioned in this verse right here, 1 Timothy 1.20. And then later he makes a reappearance in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 17 where it says this about him. I'm sorry about that. Let me get that where I won't breathe into it. All right. And their words fit, spread like gangrene, among whom are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Okay, so in other words, this dude is 
passing some bad teachings out amongst the people. Um, and in fact, if we look at some of the uh, surrounding things, one of the things that he was teaching that he's talking about that spread like gangrene among the believers is in verse 18 of chapter 2, verse 2, it says, They have deviated from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are overturning the faith of some. So these guys, somehow in their mind, they had made it up and thought, oh, that's it, the resurrection of the dead has already occurred, as if Jesus had already come back, and it was really messing with the faith of some of those early believers in that church. So this was Hymenaeus. Um, Alexander we're not quite as sure about. There were a lot of other Alexanders mentioned in the New Testament, but nothing definitive that like links them to this same person. Um, the Alexanders that are mentioned in the Gospel are highly, the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are highly unlikely to be the same person. There is an Alexander in Acts chapter 19 that is a possibility. He was called upon by, there were metal workers, silversmiths and stuff that Paul was falling into some trouble with because um, unlike today, you know, we have folks that work in silver and precious metals because they're making things like jewelry or things of that nature. But in their day, a lot of that silversmith working was to make idols for worship. And so... Paul was coming into conflict with this because when you're coming there and you're preaching against the idols of the people, all of a sudden, if your livelihood is about making idols for people to worship, well, you're messing with my breadwinner. And that's not too good. And so, there is one amongst the silversmiths and Paul that's kind of stands up in Acts 19, and his name is Alexander, and he's actually kind of a copperite or a coppersmith. So there's a possibility this might be the same guy, but we're not sure of that. Um, and this Alexander the coppersmith is actually mentioned again in 2 Timothy 4, 14, um, where it says of him, that Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. So Paul says, whatever he did, he did some great harm to Paul's ministry there in the Ephesus area. Um, and so whatever it is, uh, and then he follows up with, the Lord will repay him according to his works. <clears throat> Do we really want the wages of what we've earned before God? Most of us would say no. So Alexander the coppersmith um, this is a possibility for Alexander, but the point, all in all, is that these two were bad enough that they actually made the most wanted list as far as Paul, as far as causing trouble within this church. So what was going on in Ephesus? Well, to do that, we have to look a little bit before the passage we just read. And if you look in the early part of 1 Timothy 1, verse 3, he says, And I urge you, when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach other doctrine or pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Okay, so there have been false teachings, different doctrines, and then he talks about myths, which are people just making up stories to fit what they want to believe. And then in, endless genealogies. Uh, I don't know about y'all, if you've ever tried to read through the Bible, some of them rough parts are when you get into that Old Testament passages where it says so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat and let's get on with it, okay? Um, or when we come to the, like we just did the Christmas season, you can hit those parts in Matthew and Luke where they talk about, and this person was this person, and this person is this person. And they're important. Don't get me wrong. They're important. But the ones that are in Scripture are the really important ones. We can get tied up in a lot of that sort of stuff to say, well, and especially here in, in the rural areas in the country, we know, well, 
that person's related to so-and-so and they ain't worth a whole lot, you know, or this person's related to so-and-so, they, they haven't been worth a nickel, you know. And so there was a lot of that trying to use a genealogy to prove that this person was somebody, that this was someone you needed to listen to. And Paul's like, that's, that's a waste. That's a bunch of junk, okay? Um, and then they're just empty speculations. Um, how many of y'all, as soon as the news started talking about Israel and things going down with Israel, how much have you heard folks speculating how, oh, here comes the end, this is going to be the end, this is going to be the end, or this is the sign that the end is going to come. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be anticipating the return of our Lord, but the fact is, Scripture tells us, no man knows the day or the hour. That we're not going to know. We're not going to figure it out. So anybody trying to tell you that they know are just like what Paul's talking about here. They're involved in speculation. They're just guessing. And so these were things that were, that were tormenting them there in Ephesus. But what does Paul say their goal was? He says, the goal of our instruction, verse 5, is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So I want you to remember those three things. Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Okay? And then he says, some have deviated from these and turned aside the fruitless discussion, which he's kind of prefaced that here, and he later talks about that as he's talking about our two dudes, Hymenaeus and Alexander. And he says, they want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they're saying or what they're insisting on. Have you ever been in a situation like that where you had to try to act like you were the expert and you didn't know what was going on? Well, that's what these guys have basically gotten themselves into. They're talking about something that they don't know nothing about. And so then he says, um, in regards to that, we know, verse 9, that the law is not meant for a righteous person, but for the lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinful, for the unholy and irreverent, for those, and he starts to go down the laundry list of all the evils and bad stuff there. But notice what he says. They want to be teachers of the law, okay? They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know themselves. And he says, but we know that the law is for the lawless. Other places Paul dis defines this as the law was a schoolmaster. Now that's not like we would think a principal or a headmaster. The schoolmaster was a slave within the household of the person who had the children that needed to go to school. The schoolmaster was the slave put in charge of making sure they got themselves to school. Okay? He'd be the one to get them to the bus stop in our context, okay? Make sure they got on the bus and make sure at the end of the day they got off the bus, okay? That they went to school. So if the law is a schoolmaster, it's to make sure that we learn something. And what are we supposed to learn from the law? We're supposed to learn that we have a need, right? That we can't do this ourselves. We can't be righteous enough. We can't be good enough. We can't be pure enough. We can't be holy enough to satisfy God's law. That's the whole point of the law. It's not to give us a bunch of hoops to jump through after we've come to Christ. It's because we cannot be good enough. So therefore, we need someone to be good enough for us. And that's where Jesus comes in. And so therefore, the righteous don't need the law anymore because they've been made righteous through coming to Christ. So now, the law is there for us to help bring others to that knowledge and to that awareness of their need for a Savior that is Jesus. And so, 
And he even says that the law is good provided one uses it legitimately. The law is for the lawless and the rebellious, not for the righteous. Now, I will give a caveat here. The law is not for the righteous. That does not mean the self-righteous. Okay? If you think you got it together and everything, you probably still need that law. Okay? <laughs> so, the law is not for these things. Now, he talks about, though, when he gets down there, he says, some have rejected these. And notice he brings back those two things, faith and a good conscience. The only thing missing from his earlier statement was the love from a pure heart. Faith and a good conscience. And because they've rejected these, they have suffered the shipwreck of their faith. So, if he's using this analogy of a shipwreck, which Paul was no stranger to shipwrecks, okay? If you read the rest of the New Testament, Paul was shipwrecked as many as three different times, okay? So, he knows what he's talking about in this, to use this example. But how is our faith like a ship? I mean, we've even got good old gospel, southern gospel songs that talk about this, right? I'm going to take a trip in the... Y'all can talk, it's okay. I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel, gospel ship. ship, all right? I'm sailing far beyond the sky, right? So how is our faith, though, like a ship? Well... If we think about it, even in that culture and that time, they were scared of the seas. Okay, The seas represented the fear of the unknown. Because even nowadays, do we know everything that's under the surface of that water? Mm -mm. I mean, there are depths that we have not even plumbed in all of our scientific advancement and all the things that we know. There are things that live way down there and that in the dark with the haints and the boogers and all the things that you don't want to know nothing about. And I'm just, uh, so the sea represented the fear of the unknown or the darkness that was out there. So what does a ship do in relation to the sea? It keeps you traveling above it, right? It keeps you separated from having to be in it, okay? So if the sea represents this darkness, this, this unknown, that's pretty much an analogy for the world we live in, right? We don't know what's going to happen at the next turn, do we? We don't know what's out there, what evil's lurking in the depths after us. And so our faith is a ship by which we can travel through that and over that. What does the scripture say? It gives us the analogy that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. A ship is there in the sea, but it's not of the sea. Because if it's of the sea, you've got some problems. <laughs> okay? So, our faith is what keeps us from drowning in the murky depths of this world. Interesting side note here. Jesus was the only person in and of himself, that never needed a ship to travel the sea. Okay? Now, some would say, well, Peter did it too, but Peter did it because of Jesus. So, the ship is what stands between us and that world at large of darkness and evil. So, the ship is how we travel. Hebrews 6, 19 tells us this, if I can get there, y'all probably get there before I get there. Alright, Hebrews 6, 19, it says, we have this hope like a sure and firm anchor of the soul that enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So right there, it compares Christ to an anchor. Okay? It's the thing that keeps us stable even when things are battering our faith and tossing it back and forth. Wind and wave is pushing us everywhere. 
you got that anchor, it's solid and secure. I'm sure some of you know there's an older song out there that says, the anchor holds, though the ship is battered. Okay? So hope is an anchor, and our anchor is Jesus Christ that holds us in this situation, connected to that ship of faith. Another interesting point of, uh, while you're there at Hebrews, hang a right over to James. James gets a little tougher, but in James 3, 4, and 5, he uses this analogy. He says, and consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites. So here he's saying, just like a rudder on a ship, so is the tongue. He also says, we can say a lot of things about our faith in James, but... Our actions speak louder than our words sometimes. So our rudder can end up driving this ship of faith places that we really don't need to be going, right? So we've got our ship, we've got our anchor, we've got a rudder, and some other things from James. Uh, in the early part of James 1.6, it says this. It says... Uh, well, let me back up to verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. So he uses that example when we're in doubt. It's like we're just being tossed about. Any of you ever been in a boat that was on water it shouldn't have been in the conditions that it was currently in? It's a scary, doubtful situation. Doubtful we're going to make it to shore. Uh, pretty certain I'm going to have to see what my swimming skills are like. you know. And so here he equates that same idea that if we doubt, but I love how he starts, he says, but let him ask in faith. Okay? And then one other thing here in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4 and verse 14. to a, a verse before that or two. He says, uh, he's talking about the body of Christ and he says, um, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints and the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Verse 14. Notice the example he says. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown about by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. In other words, when we get truly strong and grounded in our faith, we're not just going to be tossed about on those ocean waves by any little teacher or any little thought that comes along. Because we are grounded enough in this that we test everything by it. So, our faith is like a ship because it keeps us from the drowning and the murky depths of this world. It's like a ship because we have an anchor, our hope that is in Jesus Christ. It has a rudder that can get us into all kinds of trouble. In fact, Peter knew a lot about that, even though he's not the one writing this letter, right? 
he, uh, he had a, a lot of taste of the foot sandwich, as they say. Um, and we are shown multiple times that doubt or being immature in your faith is like being tossed about by the wind and the wave on the sea. So, now we see how our faith is like a ship. But here, Paul was saying, the shipwreck of one's faith. So, I want to take us back in time a little bit. Um, how did ancient ships get shipwrecked? What were some ways that ships ended up no longer doing what ships are supposed to do? Well, one, it could be because of poor design or failure of the ship's equipment or hull. Maybe they used bad wood. Maybe they didn't, they made the bow too low and it would scoop up water or whatever. That could be one thing. Another could be instability due to poor design or improperly stowing the cargo. Okay, I know we don't do as much about the ship side of it. When I lived down in New Orleans and those places, they knew what it meant to not have your ship uh, decked out right with its cargo. But uh, some of you may have seen uh, videos where they talk about the safety of towing something with a trailer. And where you put the weight of the load on that trailer can affect the stability of that trailer as you get up to highway speeds. Same idea here. If you don't load that ship properly, it's going to capsize or it's going to sink, hit by the right wave. Navigation errors and other human errors can lead you into a bad way. Uh, a pretty famous shipwreck I think we're all a little familiar with is the Titanic. And they made a lot of little errors. We've gone to learn uh, that they could have avoided the shipwreck that they had. Bad weather and powerful or large waves or gale winds can also often lead to a capsizing of a ship. <coughs> Warfare, piracy, mutiny or sabotage, so other outside forces attacking the ship, um, a fire within the ship. Uh, they use a fancy word for this called biofouling, but that's basically saying growing a bunch of barnacles and incrustations on your boat. Um, they can lead to messing with how the boat actually cuts through the water, and it can ruin your vessel. Um, and then overloading with either cargo or icing. If you're in cold climes of water, you can get a lot of ice on the hull and that can overload and shipwreck a ship. So if those are the ways that a ship in the time that Paul is talking about could get shipwrecked, what are the ways that a faith can be shipwrecked? Well, um, I was as I was researching and, and looking into this, uh, one of the folks that I looked at, and I don't take everything that he says, but uh, John Piper is a, a famous pastor that a lot of people uh, put some stock in. But he equated this shipwreck, because um, there's a tendency for folks to think the shipwreck of your faith is an idea of like losing your salvation. But it's actually one of those cases where if it was shipwrecked, it was a case of you not really having that salvation in the first place. Okay, So we're still eternally secure. That's what the scripture teaches us. That once you truly are in the faith and in Christ, you're there. Okay, If you capsize, you lose it, you shipwreck your faith, it's probably because you weren't there. Okay, You had something, but it wasn't the real thing. So these are what uh, John Piper says as far as a shipwreck. Uh, one example is uh, Jesus, the parable of the soils. He talks about the different soils, and he talks about one soil where the pleasures and the riches of life sort of choke it out as it starts to grow. So there's a little baby faith that's starting to culminate and germinate, and these weeds and thorns come in, and they choke it out where it doesn't even stand a chance. So that's one example of a shipwreck that he talks about. Before that faith has actually grown and matured into something in a person's life, it gets choked out by the cares of the world. Uh, the shipwreck, uh, he mentions of uh, 2 Timothy 4.10, of 
this man Demas who had a love for this present age more than he had a love for the gospel. So to fall in love with the world and the things of this world. But we know from the songs we sing and from the Bible we read, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And of course, here, uh, Paul tells us in the Timothy passage that we start with, the shipwreck of Hymenaeus and Alexander is rejecting a good conscience and a sure faith. Then there's the shipwreck of those who escape defilements, but then they become entangled with those same defilements. That comes from 2 Peter. And then the warning against shipwreck in Hebrews 3 is a warning against the deceitfulness of sin. So sin, worldliness, being entangled in the world, um, trying to be the big shot like our Hymenaeus and Alexander here, but really not knowing what you're talking about. All of those things can lead to a shipwreck of the supposed faith that you have. And so he closes with this quote in talking about types of shipwreck. He says, from this I conclude that even though there may be real intellectual struggles, say with a person and the historicalness of scripture or parts of scripture, or with the ways of the justice of God, you know, how do we balance God's justice and his mercy? How do we understand those things? Or we get entangled in intellectually dealing with why do bad things happen to good people and these sorts of questions can sometimes mess with our soul. Even though people have these intellectual struggles, nevertheless, most of the shipwrecks of our faith are not at the root intellectual. They have nothing to do with those sorts of arguments. More times they're not, they're rather because I want what I want and Christianity is in the way. I mean, if we're being honest, it's the truth. <clears throat> it's not because of the intellectual argument someone poses that makes us set our faith to the side. It's because I want what I want, and that cross is right there in the way. So, if we're talking about how our, shipwreck, our faith gets shipwrecked, Going back to those ancient examples, yes, a person could have intellectual struggles with the gospel and come into an understanding. That would be things like we said, like poor design or failure of the ship equipment or instability due to the cargo. All these cares of the world get packed on, not in a way that they can deal with. Another way would be a small vessel drifting too far from shore. Uh, I can remember hearing stories of folks, uh, I, I served in a church that was down on the bayou in crabbing and shrimping country, and you take one of those boats that's designed for the bayou, a nice little piro, and you get too far out in that gulf, and you feel it, that you are not in waters that you should be in anymore. And this would be the case of an immature Christian that's being put under too much too soon. Of course, the other also remains true. Let's say it's a large vessel. It is a, a ship of faith that has developed over years and years of studying the Bible and with Christ and everything else, but they're navigating waters that are way too shallow for them. They're not exploring the depths of what God would have them do, and they're not venturing out to where God has put all of this into them for them to be a blessing. And they just stay in the kiddie pool region of faith. They stay on milk when they've been on steak long ago when it comes to the gospel. Well, what happens to a real big ship that goes into too small of a port? It capsizes. It runs aground. Another thing that can happen, strong and powerful winds and waves of doctrine that we aren't prepared to navigate. We get out from shore and these other thoughts and ideas and, and beliefs come hitting us from every side and we're not an experienced enough navigator to tune our sails in to the wind of the spirit. 
of his Holy Spirit. I mentioned three things earlier. I said, they said faith, they said a conscience, which conscience can also be uh, applied to the Holy Spirit because it is a guide and a conscience for our lives. But it said love from a pure heart. The sails of that ship are what allow us to catch the wind of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what motivates us to love and to be a community of faith and to reach out to others and to help others. And so if we can tune our sails in to where we catch the wind of the Spirit, that will drive our ship forward and help us navigate through the strong other currents that come our way. Warfare, piracy, mutiny, or sabotage. I mean, they're no strangers to us. Scripture tells us very plainly, we have an enemy that seeks only to steal, kill, and destroy. He would love to see nothing more than your faith smashed upon the rocks as a shipwreck. Fire sometimes happened to ancient ships, and this is the idea I would say here of passion and desire. There's nothing wrong with passion and desire as long as it is channeled properly into the proper conduits that God has for it. Um, but many times, if we let passion run amok, we can burn our ship down from the inside. Overloading. You know, it's been said of churches that sometimes that... Uh, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And how many times have you had that newly fired up, excited Christian, they've just come to Christ, and all of a sudden, oh, well, you'll do vacation Bible school. Well, you'll teach this Sunday school class. Well, you'll do this. Well, you'll do this. And we just keep stacking on the cargo onto that ship. And at the best case scenario, it becomes burnout. The worst case scenario it could shipwreck that, that fragile new faith. And then biofouling. Now, this one is probably a, a, a toe stepper for some. The idea that barnacles and incrustations grow on the ship and make it not where it's able to be seaworthy anymore. Where are they most likely going to grow on a ship's hull? When it's out at sea doing what it's supposed to do, when it's tied up at the dock. There are a lot of people in churches that have spent way too much time moored up at the dock. they got a lot of barnacles that the Spirit needs to clean off before they can get out there on the open seas and do what God's called them to do. The old saying, moss doesn't grow on a rolling stone. Barnacles don't grow on a hole that's moving through the water. And so my conclusion, how seaworthy is your faith this morning? Have you steadily built upon the keel that was laid when you first trusted Christ? Are you firmly anchored in the hope that we have in Christ Jesus? How well have you kept control of that rudder, the tongue? so that it works in concert with the spirit of love that fills our sails? Or have you let that brother fight against that spirit of love to say some things about folks that maybe ought not have been said? Have you learned to discern the wind of the spirit from the other winds of human teaching and clever deceitfulness that are out there after us? And then, are you regularly venturing forth in your faith and exercising it, or are you staying tied up at